Hey, it's Alex Clark with the Real Alex Clark brand, and I am joined with Ali Stuckey. Hello. We talk all the time, and I'm in town for Dallas for the Young Women's Leadership Summit that Turning Point puts on, our big women's event. You're speaking, and I thought, what if we just get together and talk about all the things we normally text yeah, about? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so I thought it would be fun to kind of talk about lies that Christian women believe yeah. or fall for. Okay. Which I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> yes, yes. Do you want me to go ahead and list them or do you have more specific questions? Well, I had some ideas. I wanted to ask you if you have watched the Shiny Happy People Duggar. I've watched some of it. Yes, I've watched a few episodes of it. It makes me really sad and uncomfortable. Okay. But you didn't finish it because the last episode... I haven't finished it. No, I have not seen the last episode. But you can give me a spoiler if you want. Here's the thing about this. And you've had Ginger... Yes, Ginger um, and her husband, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. On your podcast, Relatable. Yes. And so they've kind of told their story. Yeah. And it's interesting because a lot of the girls, they've broken away from the church that their family grew up in and all this kind of stuff. But the end of this documentary... It focuses on basically saying all Christians, and especially all Christian homeschoolers, all believe this. Yeah. We're all creating extremists. Right. So I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, and a lot of people were very unhappy about that. Yeah. Um, well, I could tell from the beginning that they were conflating just conservative Christianity and homeschooling and pro-lifers and Republicans with the fundamentalists who are truly fundamentalists like the Duggars and some other people. And that's what made me uncomfortable from the very beginning because there are many people online who call me a fundamentalist. This Actually, some of the really? people that they use as commentators on the show have called me a fundamentalist. They put me in the same category as the Duggars, which is really funny because I did not have anything resembling that kind of upbringing at all. My life looks nothing like that today at all. And really <laughs> what they mean by that, they probably would call you a fundamentalist in certain ways too, or your theology. Can you that imagine? we believe in traditional gender roles. We believe in the biblical definition of marriage. Really, that's what they categorize. What these people categorize is fundamentalist. You just take the Bible seriously. You actually believe that the word of God is inerrant. You believe these unpopular countercultural things about gender and marriage and sexuality. So really, they cast, or your pro-life, they cast all of those people as fundamentalist, whether or not you had a similar upbringing to the Duggars. That's where this whole documentary, I think, loses a lot of credibility, which is unfortunate. Because the sad thing about the Duggars upbringing and the IBLP, the Institute of Biblical Life Principles, I think is what it stands for, um, it wasn't biblical. That's the problem with it. It's not that it wasn't progressive. It's not that it didn't fit in with the culture. It's not that they were homeschooled. It's not even that they wore dresses. It's that they were taught a fear-based, legalistic theology, a Christless theology, a graceless theology, a merciless theology, a gospelless theology. That's the problem with their upbringing. That's the problem with the message that they received. And really what we hear from like the shiny, happy people documentary is that no, the problem was that it wasn't like feminist enough or it wasn't progressive enough or they weren't like the world enough. Well, no, that's not my, that's not my issue with it. My issue isn't that they had a bunch of kids and that they homeschooled. Right. My issue was that they were presenting something that was called Christianity, but really they were telling these kids that if you fall out of line, if you don't obey, then God is going to allow something very bad to happen to you. Because these umbrellas of protection, which are supposed to be either like your husband and your or your dad in Christ, if you do something wrong and you sin and you usurp that authority, then you're creating a hole in your umbrella where bad things are going to fall through and happen to you. So like when I talked to Ginger, and I don't want to tell her story, she wrote a book about it called, I think, Free Indeed, but she was tortured by this idea that if I choose to go have fun over going and reading my Bible as like, you know, a 12 year old girl in the afternoon, something bad is going to happen to me or my family. Well, see with Ginger, I think what's unique about her and her other sisters is they were able to kind of like leave that legalistic Christianity, yeah. or I don't even know if there there's necessarily Christianity. But when I think about women who were involved in a more legalistic version of the faith, they leave that. They almost tend to, when we're talking about mistakes that Christian women make, they tend to swing the entire other way yeah. and they find all of this newfound freedom in, in Christ. And then they're like, oh great, now I can do everything. They forget that their behavior still has to be holy and edifying. 
Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, like how do we kind of differentiate between true holiness and legalism and or like living in freedom and under grace and just like total debauchery? I mean, Galatians speaks to this, like for freedom, Christ has set you free. We don't want to go back under the yoke of slavery that sin causes. So yes, like we are free from sin. We are liberated from the burden that sin lays on us. We are also free from the law. As people who have been saved by Christ, like we don't have to keep the laws of the Old Testament in order to gain favor before God. Like we don't have to make the sacrifices that Israel in the Old Testament had to make because Christ became our sacrifice. Yeah. But it is not because of that sacrifice that we then say, well, I can do what I want to do. Like, do I keep on sinning that grace may abound? That's a question that's asked in Romans. And the answer is no, by no means. Because of love for Christ, because we are so thankful for that sacrifice, we are called to imitate him. We are called to holiness. We are called to obedience. And that's not an obedience that's out of fear or out of if my skirt is too short or if I say the wrong thing or if I you know, don't modify my behavior enough, then I won't be loved, then I won't be saved. But the question is rather... Like, how do I love God with my whole life? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's similar to being married. Like, I don't stay faithful to my husband because I'm scared. Right. I do it because I love him, because I love God, because that's what I'm called to do. And so it's that kind of fidelity and faithfulness and loyalty that is supposed to be motivated by love and a gratitude for grace rather than the fear that, oh my gosh, something bad is going to happen to me if I'm not perfect. Well, and what you're describing too is a healthy biblical version of submission versus this very warped, distorted idea of submission too that you and I've talked about is all over the trad movement and people that say that they're Christians. I mean, what do you think about that? I feel like that's something too Christian women can sometimes get wrong. Yeah, so I talked about this on my show, and then the representation <laughs> was that I think traditional marriage and family is wrong, which is absolutely ridiculous. I love traditional marriage, and a marriage between a man and a woman is really the only marriage that actually exists. That's how God defines marriage. And I also believe in Ephesians 5, that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, and wives should submit to their husbands as to the Lord. That word submission, I think, is really scary, even for those, you know, Christian women today who don't call themselves feminists, but that word just sounds very, like, like Sharia law type. They're scared I mean, to... When you when when the Bible talks about husbands should love your wives as Christ loved the church, I mean, Christ died for us yeah. because he loved us so much. Right. So I feel like people think that there's so much weight put on women that we're supposed to, it's this huge thing for us to submit, they have a lot riding on their shoulders as well. Yes, and that would have been the radical message at the time that Paul was writing the letter to the church in Ephesus because at the time, I mean, as many as many points throughout history, like the adult free male was really like the nucleus of society, the only person that really had rights. And so women, slaves, children, the elderly were all kind of just seen as expendable. And so this idea of honoring your wife and sacrificing for your wife because she is equal in the eyes of God, she's an equal image bearer, she is equally as saved as you through Christ, that would have been a very radical, even like female empowering message at the time. So yes, wives are supposed to submit to our husbands though. That is not something that we get around. What that is sometimes depicted as in, I don't know, some movements, whether it's feminists misrepresenting it or whether it's people on the other side representing it, is that a man should never consult his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, it should never be seen as some kind of partnership. Did you um, see that viral tweet from... Um that girl, Pearl, pearly things. Yeah, or I don't know who that is, but she keeps she's showing. A, she's up a famous on my YouTuber, and, line. and she's very much she speaks to the like red pill male yeah. crowd, like kind of airs out their grievances for them. But she oh, tweeted <laughs> when a guy says, "I must consult my wife" with like a barf emoji, yeah. like how cringe it is for a guy to say, "Well, I need to ask my wife first. What I said, and other people said this too. Permission is not the same thing as consultation. Like, sure, I agree that if a man is constantly like, I don't know if I can play golf or I don't know if I can take this job because my wife has to give me permission. Yeah, like I would say that the dynamics there are off. That's a problem. But I have to ask my wife is, 
I don't really know what we have going on this weekend. Yes. I'm not sure what <laughs> like our kids are doing. I just need to consult the person who like manages the calendar. And also like, yeah, my husband appreciates my judgment on things. Right. He appreciates my wisdom. And that is, you know, I actually read one of our mutual friends, Katie, um, she sent me this excerpt. I think it, I think it was her from like this, uh, Puritan book, this depiction of marriage. So Puritans are obviously throughout history were, uh, very strict and very by the book in everything. And it was a description of what they believed Christian marriage was. And this husband was describing how he consulted his wife and how he even like deferred to her judgment in some things, even though he made the decision at the end of the day, because there are some things that she has better insight on. Mm -hmm. She has more wisdom on. God has gifted her in particular ways that God did not gift the husband, certain personality types or certain foresight or whatever. A husband who loves his wife as Christ loves the church, no, is not always asking permission, but cares for her, loves her, and sees that she is a wise, discerning, judicious person that can give him some really good wisdom. Do you think there is a problem with Christian women? We get into these small groups, we get into these women ministries, and everybody sits around, they share their grievances or their hardships or whatever, and it's just like, oh, well, don't worry. You're doing the best that you can. You're doing all that you can do. And there's not enough iron sharpening iron going on. It really reminds me of, I started thinking about this. It reminds me of your book, You're Not Enough and That's Okay. But do Christian women, sometimes we, we realize that about ourselves. We're not enough and that's okay. And we've admitted that. But we have a hard time understanding yes. that holding accountability and truth with someone else in yes. the face. Yes, and believe it or not, even though I wrote that book, I have a hard time with that. Like, I really want to make excuses for the other person. Yeah. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. And there's some good to that because you do want to empathize with people's position and understand why they may be having a hard time doing whatever. But it's difficult to say you know what, I know that this is really hard, but you are sinning in this area. And because I love you, I really want you to repent. Or like, I really want you to read this passage of the Bible, or I really want you to start praying through this. Or even asking someone, okay, you're telling me about all these things. Have you prayed about it? What wisdom are you seeking? What sources of wisdom are you looking at in your life? That can throw people off. And I think, unfortunately, in kind of the age that we're in, where we can just unfollow someone as soon as they say something that makes us uncomfortable, we can unsubscribe from something that we slightly disagree with. Sometimes we treat our friendships that way. And because we've been told, well, just cut those people out of your life. They're just toxic. They're just bad for you. Yes. They're just pulling you so down. Sick of that. I am so sick of this obsession with everything is toxic. That yeah. holds me accountable in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. So we just need to get used to healthy discomfort in our friendships because that is one really gracious way that God sanctifies us by showing us our sin because C.S. Lewis said like we make far too many excuses for ourselves and far too few excuses for other people. And so we really need someone to push past our excuses in a way that we just can't and to show us, hey, behind this is actually your sin. Like, I know you're tired. I know you're stressed. How are you actually prioritizing your time? Oh, you didn't mm. read your Bible this week. I totally understand. I've been there too. Uh, what did you choose to do instead? Like, I need that. I need that. I need because that too. There are like, let's just be real. Sometimes I wake up and I get on Twitter and Instagram. I could have spent that 15 minutes reading my Bible. I chose not to. I can give a million excuses about I'm tired, I'm pregnant, I'm stressed. At the end of the day, I chose what I wanted to do and it wasn't to read my Bible. Yeah. And sometimes you need someone to call that out in you. And we should welcome that comfort and accountability I've started to, this is uncomfortable, but I've started to like, if I say something to like one of my friends that I realized later was like, mm, that was kind of gossipy, or I think that maybe they took that the wrong way, or I could have said that more kindly, I will go to them and like, and just apologize and say, hey, I said this, I shouldn't have said this or something. That is uncomfortable That is so because uncomfortable. I would like it to just go away and think, oh, they didn't think anything of it. But I've actually been surprised when a friend has been like, yeah, you know, like I kind of did take that the wrong way and it did uh, offend me a little bit. And it's like, <gasps> oh, oh, that's so I awkward. Mean, I didn't mean to, but then it's all good. Yeah. It's fine. As long as you lean into that discomfort and you think of it as sanctification um, rather than that person's dragging me down or mean to me. 
I think our lives will be better too. A friend of mine was talking about this scenario with me and she had the best analogy to explain how women are, Christian women can be timid in our friendships when it comes to holding each other accountable in truth. And she was like, imagine if you were in a boat, you were river rafting or something and your friend falls overboard. And instead of giving her a life vest, you yell out, you're doing great, you'll yeah. figure it out, it's you so got true. this, you know, um, I, I know that you've got yes. it, Go, you know you know what you're doing. Yes, yes. Instead of throwing her that life vest, when we don't throw them that life vest of holding them accountable, that's basically what we're doing. Totally. That's and I was such like, a good oh. analogy. That's such a good analogy. I, I think we also don't take sin seriously enough because we don't think it's something that is going to hurt someone. Like we kind of just see it as, yeah, that's not great, but it's fine. So it really goes back to not just not taking our friendship seriously enough or loving our friends enough, but really like taking God seriously enough that he says, this sin is so damaging to you that it needs to be out of your life. If we really believed that, I don't think we would be as timid as we are. Okay, so speaking of Christian shows or shows depicting Christianity, there's so much drama right now with The Chosen, which I've never watched. Me neither. <laughs> okay, I've never watched the show. There's so much controversy now in the conservative movement and, and amongst Christians of, is it okay, is it not okay that, I don't know, their production crew had a pride flag or something like yeah. that. Some woman I saw on my Twitter called you out, um, this Lindsay Hillbilly homemaker said, so Ali Beth Stuckey said the pride flag on the set of The Chosen shouldn't be the catalyst for viewers to boycott the show. I think this is where I very sadly get off the relatable train, your podcast. Christian production should be hiring Christians. I just can't get on board with the excuse that the industry is filled with Romans 1 individuals. Of course it is. Why not change that? Why aren't we filling the industry with men and women who seek to glorify God in all spheres? I love Allie. I deeply respect her. I owe her many thanks for helping shape my theology and my Christian walk, but we have di differed so much lately that I think it's best to listen to other podcasts. Yeah, so apparently this is a deal breaker. And I, you know, I don't have any animosity towards this person. What's really sad is that this person, I had read a previous tweet that she had tweeted from several months ago. And this is not just a random person. I think she's kind of like an influencer a little bit, like a homemaker uh, influencer. But she actually tweeted a few months ago that she heard the gospel for the first time on my podcast and that she was getting ready to commit suicide and that hearing the gospel changed things for her, which is not something I take credit for. To God be the glory for that. But it is kind of strange for me to read something like that that was so pivotal and then to say that an opinion that I had about the chosen and a pride flag on the chosen is the thing that will separate someone from my podcast. Whatever, that's that's fine. My what take was your was, opinion? Yes, my take was that I don't even know that I could say that The Chosen is necessarily a Christian show. It is right. a show about the life of Christ that I think Dallas Jenkins has been very open about. They have to take creative license on. I'm not saying that I agree with Dallas Jenkins on everything or even how the show is being produced. I think I've watched one episode or even all the content of the show. Dallas Jenkins has come on my show and I did push back on him about some of the things that he has said about Mormonism and really tried to press him on that. Um, and so what did you think about his answers? Um, I think he's careful. I think he's, I think he's, dipl I think he's diplomatic about it. I can't read into his heart and know exactly what he believes, but he's obviously being careful about his definitions of things and things like that. So people can go listen to or watch that interview. I didn't just, you know, let someone off the hook with the disagreement, but all that to say, I wasn't necessarily surprised that there was someone behind the scenes that had a pride flag, that had a pride patch. Is that something I agree with? Is that something I would allow on my set? No. Although there are people who work where I work and on my show that I know don't agree with me on a lot of different things. Um, I do think it's important to hire people with your same core values if you can. I just didn't think that this was the deal breaker that people should have. Um, there Why? were red flags, I think, probably before the pride flag. There were some depictions of Jesus that people didn't think were biblical, didn't think were in alignment with his nature of being not just fully man, but fully God. Again, I say this as someone who has not watched it myself. There are bigger theological concerns that I have seen people articulate before this. Now, if this is the deal breaker for someone, they're like, wow, I thought every single person working on every single kind of Christian show was straight. Like, okay, These are just the then that can, be your, that can be your deal breaker but and that's okay. It's like as podcasters, I get these weird things that it's like somebody gets hung up on. To me, it's like 
the smallest thing. I'm like, out of all the interviews I've done, I mean, she heard the gospel for the first time on your show. This is, you're not going to listen anymore because of like something like that. I just... It's so small. I'm sure. Th- I'm sure that you get the. I'm sure that you get the same thing. Or you say one thing, and then people like people think that I'm compromising on this whole LGBTQ issue because I said, well, maybe the pride flag isn't the thing that would make you stop watching the chosen. It may be other things. I'm not sure that this is the thing that is like the deal breaker for you, or should be the deal breaker for you. I think I would first want to judge the content, but again. There are different reasons I'm fine with that. And I'm not sure if I would have had that analysis if I were making it for the first time today, because since then, like the actors have really doubled down. They've been really rude to people that have criticized it. And I was like, okay, I didn't know that they were going to go all in on that. Dallas Jenkins has also released his statement, which I kind of, um, I, I watched a little bit of, that's fine. So people have to judge for themselves. But I was thinking like, would I have been like, would you have been super surprised or disappointed if you found out that like there was a, like a pride flag of someone who was working on Passion of the Christ? It's like, would you tell people movie, not to see it? No, no, because, because I'm like, it's not in the movie. It's like somebody obscure. And I, I agree with you of like, let's try to have people in our crew that aligns with our values totally. and things like that. The whole production itself, though, what's the message of that? I mean, yeah. So I'm just like, I'm doing apples to oranges. Uh, what carries more weight? The yeah. me- the, mes- the message of pa- Passion of the Christ or like somebody off camera randomly. That I- Yeah, I don't know. And it does again, something in their people, personal life I disagree with. Right. People might have a problem with the content itself of The Chosen, which is fine. I just think that those concerns carry more weight than what's going on behind the scenes. Now, do I think it's weird that they included, like, they should have checked that. Because this was like a promo, a chosen promo. They were like, oh, let's make sure to get the pride flag in there. That's a little weird. I agree with that. But again, I think that there are probably other issues. I don't know, for this individual, there have been a lot of things that I've said lately that have made a segment of conservative Christianity mad when it comes to the patriarchy or when it comes to... Um, the trad movement, which I distinguish from biblical Christianity and biblical gender roles. So that could have been a part of this whole thing. Yeah, you did an episode on that recently, which I loved. And one thing that I've been dying for you to talk about is another big mistake I think Christian parents make is really honing in on this gentle parenting trend. So as we wrap up, I'm dying to know your thoughts on gentle parenting. Uh, yes. So I don't think that parenting in a gentle manner is wrong. Obviously, uh, parenting that is overly punitive, that is overly harsh, that is overly like yelling and never gives your kid the benefit of the doubt, never understands that they're having a hard time. I think that that's wrong. I think that's unbiblical. I think that that is actually a violation of Ephesians where it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. And so I think parenting in a gentle, godly calm way is totally fine. But when we talk about gentle parenting, that is different. That to me, when I think of it, and there's probably different definitions, it's like this secular uh, psychology version of parenting without really any discipline. Mm -hmm. And I think it starts from this unbiblical premise that we're all good inside, that we're all good, we're just misunderstood. We're all good. They're just factors that make us bad or make us sad or make us overly emotional. It's never bad behavior that we are actually responsible for and needs to be fixed. It just needs to be understood and worked around. And that is just not accurate. Like we do have indwelling sin. We're not naturally good. We don't have to be taught to lie. We don't have to be taught to disobey. We don't have to be taught to be selfish. We are naturally those things. We actually have to be taught virtue. And that has to be modeled for us. And there have to be like different ways. And these differ among Christian, Christian parents. There have to be different ways to teach virtue, to reward virtue, and then to disincentivize bad behavior. There are gentle and loving and biblical ways to do that. Then going back to shiny, happy people, there are some unbiblical and like fear driven ways to do that. Um, But it has to start from the premise that we are all, of course, valuable, made in the image of God, but we also do have this indwelling sin. We have to be taught to align with virtue and with God's word. We don't have to be taught to be bad. So our parenting has to start with that premise. Thank you, Allie. Allie's show, Relatable. Subscribe anywhere you get your podcast. She also has a YouTube channel so you can watch 
her episodes, very similarly to me with the spillover. Um, and on the Turning Point USA YouTube channel, you can watch her speech from the Young Women's yes. Leadership Summit. Uh, yes. Any interesting topics that you know you're going to be covering this week on your podcast? Ooh, well, actually, it's pre-recorded, and so yes, okay, there's going to be some interesting. So I had on this psychologist that at some point would be a good person for you to have on too, who is anti antidepressants and actually <gasps> oh my gosh I'm so obsessed with this. and hates and hates the word I kept on saying antidepressant because I thought that, that as was, she says SSRIs or he, he he is like don't call it antidepressant because that's not what it is but yeah. also he like the ADHD medication that kids are put on basically he thinks that we're just never taught to regulate our emotions in a healthy way we just medicate it and it actually causes a lot more aggression and it alters your mood in a way that is not healthy. And then he uncovers like who is funding like the American Academy of Pediatrics. And so that's going to be this week or this next week, I think Tuesday, Wednesday, it'll be part one and part two. He's amazing. He's incredible. He like psychoanalyzed me at one point. No. And I was like, wait, what? what? Um, in, in, in like a very sweet and like positive way based on, he was like, I read your book on the way here. No. And here's what I like can tell about like you and your experiences, which is a little vulnerable for me, but he was totally accurate in his reading. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's totally my flavor. Like yes. that's my flavor of interview. He, when he you would do be, he would be great. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. We'll have more real Alex Clark branded interviews and videos coming soon. Bye.